So you're about to hear from three excellent panelists. Two are leaders in organizations that have, uh, will share their stories and discuss uh, institutional efforts in engaging audiences, specifically diverse audiences. I think what you'll find most interesting from both of them is that uh, this is not just about audience development or expansion. It's a real deep commitment to an inst through your institution. It's meaningful and thoughtful and authentic. So um, I used to start these with who wants more audience? You know, everybody wants more audience, but I think you'll learn it's, it's more than that. It's more than just people, uh, numbers coming across your uh, doorway. The third speaker, Cecilia Garibay, is a consultant in this realm and will add, um, will build on what, what, what you hear from the case studies and um, give you some practical data tips and some, some thoughts around um, hiring a consultant. I want to get to your questions pretty quickly, so they're going to go a little rapid fire. I've asked them to try and keep it to eight minutes each, um, and then we'll <laughs> try to keep it to eight minutes each, so we can open it up and have some of your questions. So um, look for that. So I just wanted to start with, with a question for all of you. Why are you here? Are some of the things I've listed up here true? You're noticing maybe a demographic shift in your community, or you're... Um, seeing other group people in your community reach the audiences more successfully than you are, or um, maybe you're hearing from your funders or your staff members that you need to increase your, your work in this world. On your, on your uh, chairs, you have this, uh, Nine Effective Practices. That's really what was born out of that book, Road to Results. I'm not going to go through each one of those. You can see them in front of you. Um, but really, I want to go over a couple bullet points. There's clearly various reasons why you want people undertake this work various goals for each organization. Um, there's some similar methods, but there's some things that are maybe step, these, are, these look equal in this pie chart, but sometimes there's a smaller step and sometimes you get stuck or you need to spend more time on one of the steps. So different organizations are outlined in that book. So please take that moment to, to, to read through the book. It's, um, I, th I know a lot of us grab that on a regular basis and it was really important work that Wallace funded um, and I want to thank Wallace. It was on the opening slide, the Wallace Foundation, for supporting this. They've been um, sending folks around to spread the gospel of, of, of increasing audience engagement, building museums, working with performing arts groups, and recently with diversity. So they're doing really great work. They have a website, the Wallace Foundation uh, Knowledge Center. Just Google Wallace Foundation. Um, they will talk, they share this information freely. That's one of the great things about that foundation is they don't just do the work and share it among their grantees. It's there for everyone. They want the field to grow and the field to learn. So if you're not paying attention to their, their website in this area or in your work, you're missing out. So make sure you do that. Um, some things to consider before I bring folks up here. We're going to have some moderated Q&A at the end, so I think just let, let them power through their presentations and then we'll hold the questions till the end. But this might be just some sort of things to think about I, that I know from our work at the Clay Studio and work that went into the Road to Results book of what, what data you're looking for, how targeted, how well do you know the audience that you're looking for. How well have you defined it? What are some of the early steps you might want to take? So I think that just fills the, hopefully fills the room with, with a few questions that you'll want to consider as you plan your questions at the end. There's also another uh, handout here on your, on your, uh, your chairs. This was a little bit about learning and data and promotional materials and tracking results. This is just sort of a, another little graphic that they've put together for you. So I am going to bring up Frederick. We'll queue up um, Dr. Frederick Bertley's uh, presentation. I love this um, bio that I got from, from Dr. Bertley that said he's a science evangelist, educator, and a consummate sneaker wearer. He's the president and CEO of the Center for Science and Industry, COSI. He's passionate. Is, that, is it COSI or COSI? COSI. COSI is the salad shop, COSI. And I've been there. I was, I was there as a kid, honestly. My, my aunt was other. He's passionate about the intersection of science and innovation. Dr. Bertley strives to ensure all people have democratic access to the wonder and power of science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Thank you for STEAM, not just STEM. Dr. Bertley. Um, thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate you inviting me to share um, these fantastic panelists. And thank you, AM, for having us here. Um, I'm going to talk kind of a little case study, so not a ton of data. Um, so this is me. Um, start with that. Um, but I, I really want to start here. So this is rocket science, ladies and gentlemen, right? Fine. Um, this whole thing with diversity, inclusion, access, et cetera, 
is not rocket science. Right? What do I mean by that? So I want to put it in the context of museums. Why is diversity and inclusion important for museums anyway? Why are we talking about audience development? Well, a bunch of reasons. One, this great country right now, 2.4 million science, technology, engineering, and math jobs open in the country. Right? So, and then as of yesterday, I'm now in Ohio, that's where COSA is in Columbus. In Ohio, we have 142, as of Monday, 142,000 open jobs, half of which are based science, technology, engineering, math. And I'm not talking about getting a PhD in astrophysics, but even a two-year community college, you can start off with a fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars job, right? So these are real things. All kinds of research here, something from the Brookings Institute telling you that by 2020, by next year, half of the jobs across the country will be based in science, technology, engineering, and math. So from a practical standpoint, there's a workforce issue. Yes, we need to get men and women to fill these jobs, right? And so when you look at workforce, well, where are we going to get these people from? Well, so here's a classic map you see it around the political times. It doesn't really reflect the robust greatness of this country. This is what this country really looks like. All right? We are a diverse country. And shockingly, you know, half of the population, of course, is female. And depending how you call it and what boxes you check, around 40 to 50 percent of Americans are non-white, and that's the workforce population, right? So we need to leverage the entire population. Yet, if I ask you to close your eyes right now and think of a scientist, somebody shout out. Who's the first scientist that comes to mind? Einstein. Bingo. This is not a magic show. I knew, I knew someone was going to say that. Okay, guaranteed. Now, if I'm asking you, think of a woman scientist. Who do we all say? Hester. Well, Marie Curie. Again, not a magic show, right? And if it's Black History Month, dare I say it, and I say, name a scientist, we all with that peanut guy, right? George Washington Carver, right? Okay, there you go. This is true. I knew you all would say this. All right. Now, if I push it, oh, by the way, what's the issue? They're all dead, right? And if you're trying to, <laughs> I respect the dead, trust me, and I'm a, I love history, student history. But if you're trying to inspire the next generation of these folks to fill these STEM workforce jobs that we're talking about, it's not going to work with a bunch of dead people. So if I push you guys, the audience, and I love the fact that you're participating here, if I push you to name me a living scientist, who do you all say? Man, just, I can't. <laughs> there's nothing here, nothing here, nothing here. Really, right? And, 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 and obviously he's awesome, but I wait for it, right? That's right. But if I then push you to say one more, there's one more you guys will come up with. Thank you. And that's my, that, that's my favorite, right? Bill, Bill Nye, and this is my favorite for a bunch of reasons, because he's called Bill Nye the science guy, and it turns out he's actually not a scientist, he's an engineer. Now, that makes no sense or no difference to anybody but scientists or engineers. But it's interesting. So Bill Nye the science guy. All right. This is amazing, right? But as much as I love the dead, we've got to respect them. And these are two formidable scientists who have really moved you know, science literacy forward in, in compelling ways. The bottom line is, um, you know, this is, this is our youth. And if we want to excite our youth, you've got to come at it differently, right? Because this is where, what, the, what our girls are thinking about today, right? And who they admire and who they respect, right? And if you ask a bunch of, of elementary or high school boys, um, you know, same kind of answers. These are the people they know. They don't know Neil deGrasse Tyson. They barely know Bill Nye the Science Guy, right? These are the folks they know. And I'm not critiquing this. In fact, the last time I was in New Orleans, somebody asked me that. I was actually here this year. We do have a clicker issue. But anyway, I was, I was here this year because I did come to see the Beyonce, Jay-Z on the run tour right here at the Superdome. So I love entertainment. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't like and revere these folks, but, but there's more to that, right? If this is a group of people we want to inspire to fill STEM jobs, et cetera, and that's not just about filling jobs. If we don't get the black and brown and female populations into science, technology, engineering, and math, we're missing out on those geniuses that are there, because genius isn't color-ridden or religious-based. They're geniuses in all these populations, and we might be missing the next Mark Zuckerberg or, or whoever you think your genius is. And especially if we want these young kids, you know, it's not going to work. So that's the backdrop for a program that I want to talk to you all about called the Color Science. Quick, Color Science program, we've done it in, in Montreal, Philadelphia, um, San Diego, Washington, D.C., and now, of course, because I'm at COSI in Columbus, we're doing Columbus. And really, um, it's a very simple premise. All scientists aren't old white men with thick glasses and pocket protectors. The women make fantastic scientists and engineers, and black and brown populations have been contributing forever, right? And so we highlight them. So for example, this is an evening with prominent female scientists, right? And one of them, I'll just talk about Agnes Klutcher, the, the second one from the bottom. She is about four foot 11 on a super tall day. Imagine she was the lead engineer for the most incredible fighter jet, right? You know that black fighter jet? 
such that, well, she was the lead engineer. Imagine that, you know, but we don't know that, right? Here's another one. Four generations of African-American role models. They always say, oh, there's no role models for young black boys coming out. They actually are. This is everywhere from an 80-year-old person responsible for the cell phone down to a physicist to a cardiologist and then an, a young engineer. So we had four generations with that, that people can identify with. I'm talking really quickly to get through this. All right, this is the one we launched this this year at, at COSI. Again, differentiated people, someone who's running research and, and innovation for all of Ford Motor Company. Right, African American woman who grew up in, in, in poor Detroit. You know, Will Burris is another amazing techie. We're gonna talk about Dr. Chen in a minute, but you get the idea. The point is we find these individuals who are out there in the community and we expose them to other community folks, whether it's young kids that we want to motivate or adults, because it's important that adults, black or white, see that they have these amazing people in different communities, right? And so then we have a program the next day, which is we give these kids a passport. It's called your passport to color science. They get this little passport book. They run around the museum and they meet all the scientists and they do hands-on or they get a hands-on interactive experience. So they learn what it's like to be a, a biologist or a, or a cardiologist, have you know, whipping through these slides because of time. Um, but you get the idea. And here's a really cool part of the program where we actually have a younger generation, high school students mentoring middle school students. So some really cool outcomes. There are some amazing people. So this is a comic strip called Spectra that's created by uh, Dr. Rosenberg. She is actually a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, physicist who's now directing the APS, American Society of Physics, um, their outreach programs, and she writes comic books. And the comic book is a, is a scientist who's a blonde and blue-eyed physicist. Like, really cool. So if you're a little blonde girl, hey, it's okay to like science, etc. cetera. Um, talk about the Fresh Prince. Well, the head astrophysicist at University of Pennsylvania is Dr. Larry Gladney, and he lived right around the corner from where the Fresh Prince was in West Philadelphia. Imagine that. Going real quickly, I'm coming to the close. Best, he's a person behind a cell phone. Him and his German colleague invented something called the Electret microphone, which is in every single cell phone around the planet. It's an African-American guy from the same place where Alan Iverson came up in, in Virginia, right? He was the first um, Latina to be part of the Fortune 500 as the CEO of a major corporation. This is Dr. Corey Bargman, an amazing um, biologist who went from gene to, to, to product and, and really made us understand it. And the last one, real quick, is this gentleman. Okay, Dr. Chen, I referenced him before. He is a, an Asian American, part of the LGBT community. He's a doctor in Ohio, in Columbus region, and he was talking about how some of it, he's a major oncologist um, doing some really terrible research. Some of his patients would be like, hey, you can't touch me. I'm not comfortable with the fact that you're part of the LGBT community. And hearing that story was incredible. But you have to understand that these people do exist and they're out there. And it's important that we celebrate the great work so that we can, we can spread that message. And so with that, and I'm not belittling this, it's not about hitting a check mark. It's about really engaging in sincere and authentic ways, reaching out to these communities, saying, hey, we want to embrace you. We want to showcase, we want to showcase um, the wonderful stuff of how you contribute to the community so we can impact the next generation. So with that, it really is not rocket science. But if it is rocket science to you, we have that too. Um, well, you should have seen the hidden figures. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Because for me, this work has to be tied to your mission. Diversity, equity, inclusion has to mean something to your institution. It's not just a nice thing to do. Because we all know when it comes time to talk about resources, if it's not directly tied to your mission, if you can't show that as impacting and moving your mission forward, people will have questions about it. And it will go the way of those cute little dodos. Okay, so this is just one slide about Fleischer. It's been around since 1898. What's important about that, it's in a part of Philadelphia called South Philly, um, which has historically been a part of the city where people, newly arrived people, have settled. So during Fleischer's time, it was predominantly Eastern European, um, Southern European, mostly Italian, and then also African American with people who had come up during the Great Migration. Um, it serves a lot of people. It has what I think is a big budget, even though people, other people don't. It's $2 million a year. So this is how it happened, the story of audience engagement. And I do have notes, and my problem is I never look at my notes once I write them down. So I'm going to try because we have time issues. Um, so here we go. So I found myself at a meeting, I don't know how, of the city, where they were discussing actually getting more newly arrived people to settle in Philadelphia. They were choosing New York and Washington, DC. Um, the reason the city wanted it, families tend to be larger, bigger tax um, base, and Philadelphia had been losing, pop losing population as opposed to gaining, gaining population. When they did some research, they found out people chose New York and Washington because there were more direct flights to their countries of origin. So Philadelphia sent, set out and is now one of the largest hubs, right? So I, I love it. I can fly direct to almost anywhere out of Philadelphia now. But thinking about that, it got me thinking about Fleischer. Dios mío. Ah, wait, went too far. So, what was happening was they were changing demographics in South Philadelphia, and we were experiencing that in our work off-site in schools, but the population at Fleischer who was coming to take classes was still predominantly white, anywhere from 50 to 60 years old, medium income of about $70,000, and college educated plus, right? So who we were serving off-site and on-site didn't match. You can't have a house divided amongst itself. Somebody loses. So. The idea was, uh, that's what it looked like when we went to schools. That's not what it looked like in the evening when people came for classes. So this is why we pursued it, because we wanted to focus on our mission. If our mo mission was to create access for everyone, everyone has to look like everyone. And then matching the internal with external participant trends. So we never referred to this work at Fleischer as outreach. And I'll get into that if I have time, right? Outreach means you're reaching outside of yourself. It is something separate. It is not who you are. Just think about that phrase for a moment. Um, and preparing for tomorrow's participants, not just the participants, but supporters, right? So lots of organizations don't realize they've already missed out on generations of financial supporters to your institution because you don't have relevancy to them, right? I am the daughter of two immigrant parents. Um, I'm really careful. I'm really clear about who I give my money to and who I don't. Not because of the way they treated me, but because of the way they treated my parents. So um, when people talk about sustainability and development, same way you court that big check writer for 10 years, not being sure they're going to give you any money, right? This is the same thinking. These are the people that are coming up. Uh, yes. So this is what we originally applied to Wallace for pretty traditional and written, not that I have anything against development people, I love them, they raise money for the work I do, but it was written pretty much in the development office, okay? Uh, Wallace said, yes, we'll give you the money, and then we revise what we wanted to do, and that's the next slide. Um, and you can just click them all up there. What we decided to do was spend most of the money on research. We actually didn't create programs during the time that we got the award. The idea was you're inviting somebody to dinner and you haven't asked them what they like, right? You're creating it based on what you think they want or might like. And we all know how dangerous that is nowadays with people being gluten-free and vegans. You, you can mess up the whole meal. You get one shot at a first impression. Um, so 
Really, this was about learning to engage with new groups of people with intent, right? It was the intention of the institution to do so. Placed a high value in arts and creative practices. And I always want to highlight this. Just because someone's not doing something with your organization doesn't mean they're not doing it and they're not interested. We have to accept the fact they just may not be interested in us, <laughs> right? Doesn't mean they don't value it. Um, and that location and distance was not an obstacle if we were offering something that was relevant to that community, right? People put their money where they think it's important. Um, next, please. And so our internal cultural shift. So the reason we did research, the reason there was no programming was we realized we had to do the work. The, or, the onus was on the organization. It has a culture. Every organization has a culture. There's the one we think it has and the one everyone else is reading externally, right? And this was about learning to read that externally. So this was our mantra. We also, yes, next slide, thank you. We also did, and this was important for us, we wanted to be sure that when we said community engagement and diversity at Fleischer, everyone knew what that meant. And we searched. A lot of arts organizations do this, but they don't actually write. They say they do this, but they don't write a definition for it. So our definition came from social service agencies and social activist agencies. Next, please. And this is what we learned 30,000 feet above the air. These were the three big um, themes that came up. Come to us. We don't know who you are. Come to where we are. Why do you keep asking us to come to where you are? Next. Show us. And we actually don't really know what you do. Fleischer Art Memorial sounds like a place for dead people. <laughs> Not where you come and get art classes, right? I mean, it's, it's legit, right? Not just show us what you do, but show us who you are. What do you value? And often organizations don't realize they're sending out a message about that, about who they value and what they value. Next one. Um, yeah, and then welcome us. And welcome us was, if you've gone out and done the other two things as an organization and I choose to come to your institution, be ready for me, right? That may mean have stuff in different languages. That may mean somebody should greet me as soon as I walk through the door, right? Because you got one shot and you've put all this work into it. And this is how we, so everyone at Fleischer, and I mean everyone, from board to facilities people, was involved in this. This is institution-wide, and information from this research was shared with everyone on the staff. Okay. 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 Um, I'm, I'm getting conflicting messages. Um, okay. So we're almost there. And as the culture shifted, so did the programming at Fleischer, right? So by the time we got to doing these things, our money from Wallace had already been spent and used. Um, but the great thing was, because we could speak to this with intention, it got a lot easier to raise money for this, right? Because we could say we've spent time with people in focus groups, surveys, ethnographic studies, we've really talked to the community to figure out why they're not coming. It was much easier to explain why this was the way we were choosing to address those issues. Okay. So we had color wheels, which allowed us to do, come to us and show us. Traditional Nigerian and Ghanaian pottery to break the mold. It's a very Western course selection at Fleischer. Dibujo Basico, which was a Spanish-only introduction to painting, which was scheduled for Monday nights on purpose because that was the night most people had off because they worked in restaurants, right? And that's when they had off. And then building community bridges, um, which... I, you guys can ask me later. These are our ambassadors. They are members of the staff. They're community advisors, not just liaisons. We're not just sending them out with information. They actually were the ones that told us when to schedule all these things and what their communities needed. Um, and we saw color wheels. That's it in the background. OK. So um, these are the evolution. This focused on learning. And I think Fleischer became what I call a learning institution. Right? It taught itself how to learn because engagement never stops. Groups will change. Who you want to engage with will always change. And obviously, you're already engaging with people because you're here. 
right? If you were engaging with no one or didn't know how to do this, you wouldn't be here. Um, okay, uh, keep going, please. Uh, and these were, I tried to think of some translatable lessons. Ask yourself, why now? Why are you doing this? And how does this further your mission? And I think sometimes the harder, the good question is, and why do it at all? If you don't, if you don't do it, what does it matter? If you can't answer that question, you're headed for trouble. It has to have real meaning for you. Um, and what we found was what we learned with one very specific group of people actually applied to many people that we served, right? Because you're beginning to think about way about how you serve people, right? We're in the business, we're in a service industry, right? Um, yes, uh, thank you. I think time is way over. Thank you all. Oh. oh, and I wanted to say this work is not just transactional, it's relational. Because diversifying means you're picking up people who don't reflect you demographically or psychographically. So it's important to know that. I don't know where to put this thing. OK, thank you. Take, take it with you. Thank you. No, I've, that, I'm really glad you, I don't want to feel too rushed, because that's um, important stuff. I remember um, being around Philadelphia while this was taking place at, at Fleischer Art Memorial. And uh, both, both Fleischer and the Clay Studio both it, it had a moment with simply the look of our materials that we were giving out. And our, our audience, some focus groups were saying, doesn't resonate with us. I'm a newly arrived immigrant community and you're handing me a college catalog and it just, did, that's not their fault, that's your fault as an institution. You really have to ask your own questions. So I just remember that as, as something we both learned. Um, so you've heard from uh, Frederick who I think really clearly touched on the concept of authenticity, really really authentically addressing your mission and your audience and, and reaching out and finding a, a, an authentic solution to what you're, what you're doing. And I, what I love also about the Fleischer Art Memorial is here's an organization trugging along that has been succeeding in its mission and is still doing what it knows and is doing what it knows and doing what it knows and suddenly it looks out and says, our entire community is different, holy cow. Like, but again, that's on you. So the, I think that's why those are such powerful stories. Um, our next speaker, Cecilia Garibay, is a principal of Garibay Group. She founded um, this nationally recognized audience research and consulting firm to help clients understand their current and potential audiences. I didn't have a sneaker story about Cecilia, but I'm very close friends with Cecilia's sister, Elizabeth, and I've actually done shots of tequila with her dad, so that is a memorable experience. <laughs> I knew I'd get you on that one. All right, Cecilia, please come up. Actually, you should know that my dad uh, is turning 86 tomorrow, so. Right. so we'll have some tequila with you in mind, Chris. Great. Well, thank you, uh, thank you for having me, and I'm excited about following these two wonderful speakers. There are a couple of points that I think they've already raised that I want to touch on. One is this notion of authenticity and understanding. As Frederick talked about, uh, the story that he told, it, it's a good reminder of thinking about moving outside your own context in understanding the broader context, right? The ecosystem in which you're in. I think Magda talked a lot about this notion of not just community, but being a learning organization, which is very close to my heart because that's actually the way I think about uh, our work, my work, and certainly the work that we work with clients on. So I'm going to start by, I guess, saying that I'd like to think about us expanding the notion of audience research to more than just an, uh, the idea of market research, but audience research much more broadly. I would also include evaluation as part of the mix, right? Because good evaluation helps you be reflective in thinking about what's working and what's not working. So I don't, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm not going to make too much of a distinction between those. So to get us sort of grounded, I'm going to move into that first slide and talk a little bit about culturally responsive evaluation. And the reason I bring this up is because there are many ways to think about methods, right? There's surveys, focus groups, uh, ethnographic studies, many things you can do. But a method does not necessarily equal understanding your underlying value. 
And so there are ways in which you can think about the orientation, the values that you bring to the table as you begin to think about research or evaluation that are really important to consider. So at Garibay Group, we focus on culturally responsive, contextually relevant approaches to evaluation. All big words to say that what we look at very closely is we look at culture and context as central considerations when we begin to do a study. And that's everything from the moment you design it to the way instruments are developed and looked all the way to the way the data are analyzed and communicated. So to give you an example, when we do a study and it's focused on a particular, with a particular uh, group or community, we try to figure out ways to then after that data are collected and we have findings to actually bring it back to the community and let them know about what we found. So that it is not an extractive process. So at its best, I think of research and evaluation as an authentic collaboration with community members and museum staff. When we work with museums, we typically ask uh, many questions, but two are paramount. What will we help you learn to make better decisions for a specific project or a specific group that you're thinking about. But more importantly, how is this study going to help you make change in your organization, and particularly your organizational practices? So I lay that out because I think that those are fundamental ways of thinking about uh, research and evaluation that we don't often think about. So now I'm going to switch and focus on three ways in which I think evaluation and research may be particularly salient here in this conversation around audience development and ways that those two can inform practices towards more meaningful engagement. So the first is this notion of leisure values. Um, and so that's, as a field, we focused traditionally a lot of our, our energy in museums of learning about what happens when people come through the door what they look like, and we often actually, the field of visitor studies started in that realm, right? People are coming, we wanna create better experiences for people who, who are here. But we rarely, for a long time, we didn't actually ask about those people who weren't coming and the experiences of those individuals. So that's one place where we can start. So in particular, what I would argue is that we need to full, more fully examine uh, the leisure values and intentions and perceptions of audiences that uh, are potential for us but that we haven't yet reached. And so one way to do that is thinking about what are the value sets that align between your organization and potential communities. And again, we bring a really asset-based perspective. So for example, instead of asking, why aren't people coming to our institution, we might actually be asking questions like, what is happening in this dynamic that potentially is not allowing for the kinds of experiences that individuals Value. Or perhaps there are values that are actually we sync up with, but we don't actually make clear. So those are some of the questions that we can think of. So in our work around leisure values in particular, uh, we focused it uh, began early on the Latinx community and then moved on to many other um, uh, communities that we worked with in collaboration with different museums. But these studies typically involved um, focus groups with participants to really understand this idea of during their free time, what are some of the values? What are the reasons that certain things make it on the table and others don't? And so I'm going to show you some data from, basically it's a compendium of about 26 focus groups in the U.S. involving a number of institutions, including places like the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, the Palm Springs Art Museum, the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose, uh, the Brookfield Zoo. Those are just some of the folks who were part of this study. So if you can look at the next slide, one of the things we looked at, we were mapping perceptions of leisure destinations around two dimensions. The first dimension on the x-axis is passive to active, and the more important one I want to pay attention to here is is um, the y-axis of knowledge. And by knowledge, I mean how much understanding it takes for someone to actually be able to engage in that activity. So if you click on the slide one more time, you'll see there are a number, and I don't see how, know how clear this slide shows up in the back, but there are a number of different leisure activities that individuals do. The ones that are circled in red are all museums. So the perception of art museums um, to the uh, upper left hand quadrant is where you see it there. So there's art museums, history museums, science centers, zoos, and children's museums. What does this tell us? If you think about this list, the other things that are on there are things like church, uh, parks and pools, water parks, sea world, and so forth. 
Now, what, what was interesting about this is that what this tells us is that museums are seen by many communities, in this case, very specifically Latinx parents, um, are seen as highly coded places, enigmatic places that take a lot of effort and understanding to know how to even access them or what to do in them. Now, that's not because individuals aren't smart. You see that um, there are other, many, lots of other um, leisure activities up there. But what it does tell us is that the research with non-museums goers can point to those places where there may be disconnects. This particular one I get excited about because the enigmatic aspect of it is because we don't make apparent. I think it's what Magda was saying earlier. We don't make clear how you access, what we're about, what you do in our spaces, and even, frankly, if you have permission to come. So those are some of the areas. But on the flip side, some of the research around leisure values, for example, can also point to places of synergy for museums. So for example, in one of our studies with Latinx uh, parents, we found that education was a very highly regarded value, one which then uh, the museums we were working with could really use as a leverage point, not just in their marketing message, but really thinking in the actual deep kind of programming that they, that they offered. I'm gonna move on just for um, purposes of time. Another area where audience research and evaluation can be particularly helpful is in looking very carefully at informing practices around representation. And by that I mean how non-dominant groups in museums are represented either in the content or also in terms of the organizational culture. So we've done a lot of studies um, in many different museums uh, where we're looking really clearly at this notion of representation. So for example, we've been working with Crystal Bridges Museum of Art, the Detroit Institute of Art, the American Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian Latino Center, just, and I name those just to give you a sense of the way that you can plug much of these ideas into very different kinds of institutions. So the techniques we use to look at uh, ideas of representation are around everything from discussion groups with, fat, with uh, community members, it might be um, interviews, it could be ethnographic studies where we actually do videoing, but the point is that these techniques, while varied, can get you at two things. One, they can get you a sense of what authentic full representation looks like. And so I'll uh, just to the next slide. At the end of the day, what are we learning? We're learning that what people want is to be feel fully represented authentically and holistically across that museum. So I'm gonna ask you to move to the next slide just to give you a couple of quotes of the kinds of things I'm talking about. Well, first quote, for example, refers to the fact that there aren't people that look like me. Why would I come? The other is really more about an interesting image marketing piece uh, where we were working with an organization looking at some of the messaging pieces and you can see very clearly the, the issue even just in the images, right, that are depicted are these are some of the kinds of salient information that good research that where you're looking authentically at that collaboration with community can really uh, tease out and emerge. And these can be, there can be some ouch moments in these, as you can tell. Those aren't easy kinds of um, things to hear if you're in a museum, but they become those entry points, those moments where you can really peel back and think as a learning organization um, where you might actually be willing to make change or think about making change. I have about a minute, so I'm just gonna move quickly to the next one. And this is an area of research and evaluation that I hear much less talked about, which is that we talk a lot about research and evaluation in terms of audience, but we don't often think about it and in terms of internal culture. And I would argue that this is a really important piece to be thinking about because it's the linking of your internal practice, your internal culture, that's really going to make a difference in the way that you're thinking about uh, your audience development. So I would just say, just to the quickly the next slide, is that there are many ways you can think about it. So for example, right now through the Cultural Competence Learning Institute, which is like a cohort model uh, that is part of the Association of Science Technology Centers, the Children's Discovery Museums, and Garibay Group, one of the things that we run is staff surveys that allow institutions to understand how staff is feeling about their workplace and about DEAI and understand how inclusive practices internally also 
translate externally. And again, even analysis of simple data, for example, have you analyzed your compensation to look for differences based on different factors such as gender, uh, age, uh, race, ethnicity, you could do that. You could look at promotions and looking at how if you, if you uh, disaggregate the data, again, by age, gender, race, ethnicity, do you have any kinds of disconnects? Those are simple things that don't even require a consultant, right? You can do that for yourself. So I'm going to stop there in the interest of having a conversation um, about some of what we've heard. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Yes, um, we have a microphone here for this group. Um, I have one or two questions I'm going to start with, and then I'll hopefully turn it over to y'all. And I think we get an extra five or six minutes since we were waiting on a technical assistant. Um, OK. Um, just because we came right out with, with um, talking about authenticity, I, and I noticed Dr. Uh, Frederick, I just call him Frederick, right? Uh, Frederick, um, can you, at the very end of your slideshow, you, you put a, a quick shot of hidden figures there. Can you, when we talked on the phone, I was pretty excited by why you think this work is so important and your story with Katherine Johnson. So, so the slide that didn't work at the end, hidden figures. Can you show of hands who've seen hidden figures in the audience? Oh. Okay, and so those of you who haven't, it's, um, first of all, it's a great movie, but it's unbelievable that Katherine Johnson, the main star played by Tahira, um, Taraji, sorry, um, she turned 100 years old. She's alive right now. She turned 100 years old last August. Think about that. We all met her, myself included, I don't pretend to be, we all met her or knew about her two years ago when the blockbuster movie Hidden Figures came out based on the best-selling book. Imagine how many girls would have thought that they could have been engineers or mathematicians if they saw her 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Imagine how many black girls and boys. I mean, this is incredible. So, so for me. Who was she, for those who didn't? I'm People oh, sorry, sorry. No, so, no, if, so if you don't know who Katherine Johnson is, so this is an African-American woman who's roughly in her 30s or so who was picked by John Glenn, okay? One of the most famous, deservedly so, astronauts of our time. He's from NASA, but world astronauts, without question. He's the first person to successfully orbit planet Earth. He picked her, and the movie is on point. There's no exaggeration there. He single-handedly picked her to do the hand mathematical calculations to make sure he could successfully orbit our planet and come back to Earth. He picked not just a woman, an African-American woman. Now think about how powerful that story is, yet we don't know about it, right? And so that's why I threw it up there, this yeah. idea of you know, intentionally recognizing the men and women who are in our communities, who are doing transformational things through science, technology, engineering, and math, that's how, how you're gonna get the next generation to be excited. But there are a lot of things you can, like day-to-day -day things you can do that make a difference. You know, Color Science is a bigger program that we intentionally bring in people from the LGBT community who are scientists. Why? As a scientist, I can tell you, that's one of the most homophobic um, professions out there. It's unbelievable how prejudicial it is against the LGBT community, but people don't think about that. So identifying those scientists, bring them in, and being, you know, being intentional about wanting to hear the stories. And, and so, but there are other smaller things. For example, I met a woman who came through the atrium. She had a shador, a she was clearly a Muslim woman with her family. And I said, Salam alaikum to her. That's all I said. Next thing I know, my, my guest services, three days later, gets this long email about some employee. She didn't know I was the president CEO. Some employee greeted her in a very important message to her, and blah, blah, and she wrote this whole long email because I simply said, salam alaikum, which is you know, the Muslim term for, you know, may God, may peace be with you, et cetera. It's just a Muslim greeting. But that little thing meant the world to her. She felt welcomed. Do you know what I mean? And so, you know, and there's a long list of everything in between, but there has to be intentionality and it has to be, you know, your leadership has to be on board. You can't be kind of doing this, you know, going out to your marketing stuff, but you come back into the building like, well, good job in marketing, but we're not changing our images in the building, so. I think we have time for one more, and then so we do our surveys and get our books. Sorry, please. And most we can visit too. So I would. My name is Amber Kerr. I'm, I work in a visible conservation lab at the Smithsonian, and we have such an amazing collection at the American Art Museum. But I'm trying to connect our 
local cultural communities because of our collection so diverse and because I work behind glass walls, I want them to see scientists and the opportunity of art and science together. But I really loved your ambassadors, is that what you call them? How do you find these community connections? Because I'm, I'm searching for that and trying to cultivate that um, so that I can start to get them to bring people to the labs to see us. Oh, um, so Fambassadors is Fleischer Art Memorial Ambassadors, Fambassadors. I didn't come up with the name. I really am bad at that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm glad someone else did. But um, so there are a couple of things that happened. Um, number one, in our focus groups, there was a shot there of a woman with lots of kids around her. Her name's Nancy Vargas. She was in that focus group. She enjoyed and felt so respected by the way that focus group was run that she decided she was going to start bringing parents and kids. She's what I referred to as a bridge person. There are people in those communities that you're thinking about who, for whatever reason, naturally seek out um, resources for their communities and they bring them back, right? That's not their job, but they're there. Um, the other thing is, at museums, because I've, you know, I've done this talk here before, but also for the Zoological Society, is look at your staff, and I'm, I may be wrong, but when I walk in a museum, the security at the museum looks like the people everyone is saying they can't engage. <laughs> Oftentimes, those security guards reflect those communities that you say that you're having trouble engaging. They're in the building. Talk to them. Right? Yeah. Talk, talk, <laughs> talk to, to them. them. Yeah. Make them. I know that yeah. sometimes you're hiring out another firm, maybe taking care of them, but you should be making them feel like they don't just stand there all day long, right? That you see them. And a lot of this work is about allowing people, letting people know you see them, right? Mm -hmm. You see them as another human who has something to offer. So, um, you know, and then Nancy did that, and we're like, hmm, what if we're intentional and we find and we seek these? Um, ambassadors. The important thing is, and I forgot to mention this, is Fleischer had been doing work in those communities for a while. So we also had trust by proxy with lots of community groups who would say, these people are going to treat you right if you go there. We've been working with them for five years, right? People know when you're going to them and you want something. And what they're going to do is not give it to you, right? If they feel used. Yeah. Um, and that's where the authenticity, authenticity comes in. Comes I, don't, I hope yeah. I'm answering yeah. your question. <clears throat> um, I want to give a quick round of applause to our, our panelists here. Thank you.